from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up today on Ag Day, taking farming to a whole new level, how this virtual farming world has become a big hit. Portions of the heartland hit by more flooding. At new signals, the Fed is ready to cut interest rates. The slowdown in business fixed investment may reflect concerns about trade tensions and slower growth in the global economy. Ag Day, presented by the all new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Betsy Jibben. Clinton has the day off. The stock market soaring on Wednesday. It follows the release of Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell's semi-annual monetary report to Congress. Powell testifying before the Financial Services Committee, signaling the Federal Reserve will likely cut interest rates later this month for the first time in a decade, attributing it to a weakening global economy and rising trade tensions. Our baseline outlook is for economic growth to remain solid, labor markets to stay strong, and inflation to move back up over time to the committee's 2% objective. However, uncertainties about the outlook have increased in recent months. In particular, economic momentum appears to have slowed in some major foreign economies, and that weakness could affect the U.S. economy. Moreover, a number of government policy issues have yet to be resolved, including trade developments, the federal debt ceiling, and Brexit. Economists are suggesting Powell's prepared remarks made a quarter point rate cut a virtual certainty at the Fed's meeting this month, with many forecasting further cuts to come. As for trade talks with China, the Chinese Foreign Ministry confirming top trade envoys of China and the U.S. have spoken by phone on implementing plans to restart trade negotiations. It's the first contact since President Trump and Chinese leader Xi Jinping agreed to restart to talks after they met at the G20 summit in Japan at the end of last month. A ministry spokesman gave no details beyond saying the two sides had exchanged views. He also declined to comment directly on a report that to help revive the trade talks, President Trump told Xi Washington would avoid criticizing Beijing over the street protests in Hong Kong. It was first reported in the Financial Times. The report claims the president made a similar pledge in a phone call with Xi ahead of the G20 summit. The White House and State Department declined to comment. USDA is releasing a slew of reports today, including its crop production and WASDE reports. Normally, green traders and farmers wait for the big August reports, but this year has been different. USDA saying it's resurveying its corn and soybean acres in over a dozen different states, and those acres will be released in August. One analyst tells us why the potential corn number will be more of a challenge for this report. Now on the corn, that's a little bit more challenging. Traditionally, like I said, they'll take that corn acreage in June and plug it into the July WASD report. But I've been doing this for almost 25 years. I can't ever remember a time where the June acreage survey came in with higher acreage numbers than what the board used for the WASD estimate in June. So that's where a little bit of the confusion is coming in. Logically, historically, they'll plug in those extra 2 million acres into the balance sheet, and that'll kind of give you a bearish reaction because you're probably going to see some overall supply grow unless they surprise us and cut the yield. So if you notice, the grain markets have been kind of weakening as, as in preparation of that bearish report. Both the reports will be released today, noon Eastern. Look for coverage on air and online from Ag Day. USDA announcing it is extending the deadline for farmers in states hit hard by wet weather to report spring seeded crops. It includes the 12 states on your screen. The new date is Monday, July 22nd. Producers not in the states highlighted must field reports by the original Monday, July 15th deadline. Undersecretary Bill Northey says the deadline extension is part of a broader effort to increase program flexibility and reduce overall regulatory burdens for producers. Nebraska is dealing with yet another round of flooding after heavy rains fell in the south central area of the state. Flash flood warnings were issued after up to nine inches of rain fell in some spots during storms that struck Buffalo, Dawson, Frontier, Gosper, Kearney, and Phelps counties. The Dawson County Sheriff's Office said several cars were stalled in high water on U.S. Highway 30 in Lexington, and Kearney firefighters and a dive team were called out to help people unable to leave their homes. No one was injured, but U.S. 30 was closed by flooding just east of Odessa. 
The worst of the flash flood likely has abated, but flooding is still expected along the Platte and other rivers as the storm runoff moves downstream. There's an extra push because of the spring flooding for money to improve infrastructure on our nation's waterways. The Subcommittee on Water Resources and Environment hosting a hearing on Water Resources Development Acts. Already a discussion and hearing testimony on a possible water bill for 2020. Usually, Congress enacts a bill every two years to improve lock and dam structures on our nation's waterways, known as WERDA. And 2020 is the next time funds could be allocated towards the cost. In Arkansas alone, we've seen an estimated $23 million per day in uh, economic loss uh, along the Arkansas River as barges and boats can no longer navigate our inland waterways. Much of this waterborne commerce is dependent on infrastructure that was initially constructed in the 1960s and 70s and is quickly approaching the end of its shelf life. The Army Corps of Engineers, Drainage District Associations and other water groups testifying about possible needs for updated money and legislation. Some people are celebrating all things cow as Mike shows us in today's crop comments. Thanks, Betsy. Well, earlier this week, farmers were celebrating Cow Appreciation Day and Tim May of Ontario, Canada marked the occasion by sharing this video on Twitter. This cow loving every moment of this nice scratch. Tim saying if you take care of them, they will take care of you. Now, taking a look at the wind speed forecast, you can see how we are uh, going to be a little bit breezy across parts of the southwest Great Lakes and the far northern plains. Heading through the nighttime hours tonight, not too much as we head toward morning when you talk about winds. But as we head through the day, of course, they'll pick up a little bit. Now, they're going to start to show up there in southern Louisiana, depending on how close that next uh, tropical-like system is at that moment. I'll have more on that and your forecast coming up, but first, here are some hometown temps. Introducing Farm Journal TV, on demand 24-7. Ag Day, Machinery Pete TV. U.S. Farm Report on your phone and tablet. Download the Farm Journal TV mobile app today. Growing potatoes and carrots high in the windswept mountains of western Venezuela had always proven a challenge. But since oil production in the South American country has collapsed under years of mismanagement and U.S. sanctions, many farmers are confronting another hardship fuel shortages. Without a dependable supply of gas, critical shipments of pesticides have been entirely cut off. Basic equipment has become impossible to operate. Field workers can't be bussed in and crops aren't arriving at markets. While the nation boasts the world's largest reserves of oil, ag and related industries in Venezuela still account for a critical sliver of the country's GDP, which has shrunk by more than 70 percent since 2020. In Russia, officials are raising alarms about mass bee deaths in that country. The Russian Agricultural Ministry says the bees have been dying in large numbers in at least seven regions this year. Experts believe the deaths are related to careless and excessive uses of pesticides at nearby fields. The ministry says the mass deaths recorded from western Russia to Siberia have had a substantial financial impact on beekeeping in Russia, but did not provide any figures. Many are focused on what the USDA has had to say about this nation's corn crop lately, but what about soybeans? Why one analyst doesn't want you to be too concerned about the calendar. And later, farming as a game. We look at the latest version of this game that is a hot seller right now in the country. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Soybean prices are back above the 40-day moving average, but traders were cautious ahead of USDA's reports today. Here's more on how Wednesday finished at the CME. Today in the grain market, soybeans rebounded. That was the estimates uh, were uh, of lower production have really started to uh, get the market starting to move. Now the trend really remains lower and today's action is encouraging, but only if we get really follow through support. Uh, we're going to watch very closely as tomorrow, tomorrow's report comes in. If you re remember over the last maybe three months, we had some whopper of numbers. So, you know, everyone's kind of like uh, just crossing their fingers uh, and uh, hanging on to their hat, waiting for these numbers to come in, even though we did get the estimates. Uh, it remains to be seen. Hogs, on the other hand, surged today. There are really concerns about the Af African uh, swine uh, fever 
uh, has everyone uh, worried that the disease uh, will spread. And if it does to spread to any other countries, um, you know, that just tells us that, you know, it is really widespread in Asia. The talk lately has been around USDA's acreage report when it comes to corn. But what about soybeans? Tyne Morgan has this analysis from our Kansas City studio. Here now with Matt Bennett of agmarket.net. Matt, when you look at acreage, when you look at yield, let's talk about soybeans. Um, you know, USDA thinks we planted 80 million acres of soybeans. However, that was of June 1st. And as we know, you know, I talked to some farmers in Illinois that said I didn't plant a single day in May, yet when June came around, window opened up and we got a little bit more planted. So do you think that 80 million acres kind of the lowest acreage number that maybe we see in soybeans? I would think so. You know, if I was going to compare, I'd say corn has room to come down and beans has room to come up. Part of the reason why I say that is because so many planters have been rolling here in the last week to 10 days. Uh, you know, and, and we all know that these bean yields have actually been awfully good on double crop the last couple, three years in my part of the world in South. And so anyone who's double cropping beans after wheat last couple, three years has had up to 60, 65 bushel oh, beans on double crop, really? which is phenomenal. And so I don't want to, I don't want anybody to be too discouraged about the calendar uh, if they haven't been used to doing double crop themselves and, and, and they're, they don't plant any wheat. Hey, go ahead and throw those beans out there because they still, uh, the genetics are going to give you the opportunity you still have pretty darn good beans. And typically we say, you know what, August rains makes or breaks the soybean crop. But this year, do you think it's September? Yeah, it's going to be for some of those beans. And considering the fact we've planted well over half the bean crop after June 1st, there's no question about it that the weather pattern uh, that we need is going to be significantly different than what we've needed here the last several years. And so uh, this is going to be a very interesting market. Uh, I think as far as soybeans are concerned, what you need to see, uh, again, with corn, Liz, with corn, you need a little bit of heat, but you need a lot of rain, especially later in the growing season. Even with if we do have 80 million acres, even if we do see this yield come down a little bit, I mean, still, the bottom line is we have a lot of soybeans and that hasn't changed, right? We have a lot of soybeans, there's no question, uh, from a world perspective and a U.S. perspective. How much can we cut into that U.S. carryout? You know, we've seen people uh, throw out, maybe we get down to 500, maybe we get down to 600. Comparing that to the average over the last 10 years, that's a big number yet. And so I don't want to get too awfully bullish here. Uh, yes, there's some bullish things to talk about, but in the grand scheme of things, we still need to be locking some profit margins in because we've got profit margins we didn't see this winter and opportunities we didn't think we would see in 2019. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And, I, and it's something that we don't need to uh, sneeze at. Uh, bottom line on soybeans is that we were all pretty frustrated two months ago whenever uh, November beans, we didn't know if they were going to stay above $8. And then here we are. We've been trading over $9 this week for the most part. There's been some opportunities. All right, Matt Bennett, agmarket.net. Thanks so much. Stay with us. We need to take a quick break, and then we'll have much more right here on Act Day. To contact Matt Bennett at Ag Market, call 844-4-AG-MARKET or visit their website at www.agmarket.net. The IBM Watson Decision Platform for Agriculture, helping to feed a hungry world with the power of AI. Welcome back. Well, Mike, since I'm filling in today, I thought I'm going to give South Dakota some love. <laughs> and so I'm going to show a picture of my dad, Jim, and his corn crop in Southeast South Dakota. And just to give you an idea of what a wild planting season it has been for him. So on one side, you can see the corn he planted on May 20th and the other, the corn he planted on June 8th. He had to plant at different times because of the wet conditions we've seen around the Corn Belt, and that holds true, I think, for a lot of farmers. Yeah, I've seen belt. that a lot in northern Indiana just driving around. You can see, you know, just the one row is different than the next, and that's where they had to stop and start again. It's been an interesting year. So it, what do we have going on for weather It really today? has. Well, things have dried out, obviously, a lot. Uh, there's still very wet conditions overall in the root zone moisture, but uh, we are starting to see pockets where it's drying out. If you look real close, there are some dry pockets there in north central Indiana, a few pockets in Missouri, and also Iowa. Uh, but those are kind of in the middle of larger areas that are still on the wet side, or at least uh, can, compared to normal, it's wet. Most areas from uh, mid-Atlantic Pennsylvania all the way back through the Plain States. There are definite dry areas, southern Louisiana, that's going to change over the next uh, three or four days as the tropical system comes in there. And you can see it's dry in parts of the southeast, parts of northern Minnesota, and parts of the uh, northwest, as well as Arizona. But overall, there's a lot of blue on that map compared to the uh, 
the oranges and reds in this case. And we talked about this tropical system. Now this may very well be tropical storm or hurricane Barry before too long, but uh, as of as of uh, just a little while ago, it was still an area of low pressure and that uh, will probably change as we head through time. And that's going to be an interesting situation there. You can see this cool front moving into the western Appalachians as we head through this afternoon. Showers and thunderstorms ahead of it. This is com comfortable air for at least a, a day or two behind it before the <clears throat> heat starts to come back from the southwest. Next uh, cold front really not going to make much progress as you'll see. Heading through uh, tonight and into tomorrow morning, you can see the system uh, more than likely buried by then. But again, I can't uh, can't put it on the map quite yet. That is going to be interacting with this cool front coming southward along with record levels in the southern Mississippi. This could be a real bad situation for the, that part of the country. It all depends on where it comes in, obviously, but it's going to be widespread rain. I think rain's going to be the bigger issue than the winds in this particular case. All right, precipitation estimate uh, past 24 hours. Next 36, you can see how we do add some in the mid-Atlantic and parts of the southeast. As far as the heat is concerned, it's going to stay hot south of that front, 90s, even a few triple digits, but cooler temperatures by tomorrow morning north of the front, and that's going to continue as well as we head into the afternoon hours tomorrow. Heat index values you can see are going to get very hot south of the front once again. Definitely, definitely triple digits in places. And there's the uh, jet stream. You can see that ridge coming out of the west. The trough goes away in the Great Lakes in the northeast as we head into next week. And that means hot across most of the Corn Belt, most of the country, as a matter of fact. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We had to Flagstaff, Arizona, a partly sunny thunderstorm in some spots, high of 83. Taking a look at Rice Lake, Wisconsin, partly sunny and comfortable, high of 78. And Tampa, Florida, muggy, a thunderstorm around, high around 88. Well, drought conditions to the north and overly wet conditions in the Midwest could mean for feeder cattle prices next. And later, celebrating a game that turns anyone into a farmer in the country. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. The beef industry has a concern feeder cattle prices in the United States could dip due to dry weather in Canada. Unlike the wet conditions over the spring in the Corn Belt, much of Canada's beef producing provinces have been experiencing drought. Therefore, producers are selling and culling some herds because of it. In the last four months, we've already seen a 22% increase in feeder cattle imports from Canada. Um, now, their numbers are not near as high as the U.S. numbers. In fact, Canada only has uh, roughly a million cattle on feed compared to the United States, which has 11 million cattle on feed. But those cattle, uh, that number of feeder cattle imports could have an impact on prices in the United States. Henderson says it's a combination of Canada exports more cattle to the United States and if grain prices here at home put pressure on the feeder cattle market later too. Drovers reporting May beef exports were steady year over year in volume, while export value increased 1% to $727.6 million. That's the second highest on record, trailing only August 2018. Beef export value per head of fed slaughter averaged $312.85 in May. That's down slightly from a year ago. For January through May, beef export value averaged $309.33 per head. That's down 3%. Can't get enough when it comes to farming? You're not alone. How a game is taking things to a whole new level. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. A farming game appears to be a big hit with farmers and non-farmers alike. GameDaily.biz reports Farming Simulator 19 has just surpassed the 2 million sales mark. The company that makes the game says it has beaten its guidance target by more than 20%. The company attributes some of the new sim success to a new added feature in the game, landscaping. You can now modify the ground, including controlling the shape and color of it. You can touch up the grass or lay down 16 varieties of ground, even mud and even move mountains. 
Or how about even throwing some economics into it by letting you decide how profitable it will be to trade and sell things. The game retails for $35. Well, that's all the time we have this morning. We're glad you tuned in. For all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Betsy Jippen. Have a great day.